it's important to to mention that the role of Wulindlele is not to sugarcoat progress. Um, our role is to provide an independent view of progress in, in reform implementation, um, to identify problems and challenges and to resolve those in a hands-on way. Um, the, the whole point of OV is, is to take a problem-solving um, approach and to try and accelerate progress wherever we can. So what this slide shows in just a snapshot is progress across the 26 reforms that fall into those five focus areas that Rudy spoke about. We've chosen these reforms as our priorities because of their potential impact on growth. Um, and although the, the challenges that we face in South Africa can seem daunting, uh, one of our advantages, I think, is that we've, we've long diagnosed the problems. We know what the constraints on growth are, um, and, 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 and the, the objective now is to deal with those. So these 26 reforms, we think, represent um, actions that we can take that will have a real impact. You can see on that slide that um, eight of, of these reforms have been completed um, since OVI was established in October 2020. Those are marked in blue. Um, we haven't stopped working in those areas, even where we've, we've gotten a particular reform over the line, we've ticked it off. Um, we continue to work, as Rudy said, to follow through and to make sure that, that the impact is realized. Um, a further 11 reforms are on track. Those are uh, moving, uh, they're, they're meeting their, their deadlines, um, there's progress and work happening. Um, five of the reforms in yellow uh, are experiencing some challenges, and two are, are experiencing what we call critical challenges. Um, those are two reforms. Um, in the first instance, the risk mitigation power procurement program, which we all know has experienced a sequence of delays. Um, and then ESCOM's energy availability factor, where the performance of older coal-fired power stations has been deteriorating. Those are two reforms that face real challenges, but if you look at the picture as a whole, you can see that, that there, is, there is real progress. Um, these, the, the process of reform is complex. It's never a straight line from A to B. It's, it involves often difficult policy, regulatory changes, even legislative reforms, the establishment of new institutions, or really fundamental changes to existing institutions. This is, a, this is hard work. Um, and yet, through the OV process, we've seen um, a lot of movement. So, just to focus on a few things that, um, a few highlights really of, of this year to date. And, and this list really speaks to just 2022, so the last couple of months. Um, one of the major things that we've seen was the completion of the Spectrum auction, um, which, which has brought really finality to that very long delayed process. Uh, and that's a really significant boost for the telecommunications sector, but also for the economy as a whole, um, because of the importance of, of that network industry to many other sectors. We've also seen a lot of movement in accelerating the procurement of renewable energy. We've revived um, the REAP program, we saw um, bid window 6, the RFP being released for another 2,600 megawatts of power. Those proposals are expected in August, um, and the preferred bidders for bid window 5 are expected to reach financial close in the next few months. A major um, fundamental change that's underway in the electricity sector is through the amendment to the Electricity Regulation Act as the key piece of legislation that governs how the electricity sector works. And in February, the amendment bill um, was published for comment. It's being finalized now. Um, and that, that bill, alongside the restructuring of ESCOM and the establishment of an independent transmission company, will completely reshape the way that the electricity sector works um, and for the first time will introduce a competitive electricity market um, in South Africa. So that's another um, marker of progress in the last few months. 
We also saw in March the white paper on national rail policy being finalized, again after many years of delays. Uh, and the importance of that policy is to provide certainty around things like third-party access, allowing private rail operators to utilize the network, but also the devolution of passenger rail um, and other really important policy decisions in the sector. Um, in, in water, we've seen the green drop report and the blue drop and no drop water quality monitoring system being revived. It had been stalled since 2014. Um, and that gives us a, a view, line of sight, into how um, water systems are performing in municipalities across the country um, and enables intervention where municipalities are failing, particularly with the crisis in, in wastewater treatment works and so on. Um, also in water, the backlog of water use license applications has been steadily addressed. Um, DWS is down to less than 500 um, water use licenses outstanding, what used to be a really um, tremendous backlog. And they're on track to completely clear the backlog, backlog by the end of this month uh, in the next two weeks. Um, we saw in February also the revised critical skills list published again for the first time since 2014. And that includes a whole range of occupations that are new that weren't in the previous list. A lot in the IT sector, for example, where where we really need to attract skills um, in South Africa. And finally, in April, we saw an RFP issued to initiate third-party access uh, on the rail network, um, including on, on the NatCore um, Durban to City Deep Line. That was an announcement that the president had made in Sona, and then in, in April, the RFP was released. So that's not a comprehensive list, but it is it does give you a sense of the kind of work that's underway and the milestones that have been achieved um, in this year. We've also tried to just capture a few things to look out for in the months ahead and in the rest of 2022. Um, one of those is following the auction of spectrum um, is to complete the switch off of analog transmission and digital migration. Um, that will really allow this new spectrum, particularly in the lower frequencies, to be used by mo for mobile telecommunications. Um, and a lot of work has been happening to complete that process finally. Um, the Electricity Regulation Act, having completed the public comments process, will also be finalized soon, submitted to Cabinet and then tabled in Parliament. And I've spoken about just how fundamentally important that piece of legislation is. Um, so there are really major shifts that we'll be seeing in the electricity sector over the next six months and beyond. Um, we are going to see third party access finally being initiated um, by making 16 slots available on Transnet's uh, network. And that will be the first time that private operators are able to utilize the network. Um, this, this is a particularly important reform, um, both because of the challenges that we've experienced in freight rail, and as all of you will, will know, um, but also because of the huge investment potential that it has to unlock. Our estimates suggest that um, there's between 60 and 70 million tons of freight per annum that could move from road onto rail um, if, the, if the capacity existed. There are some estimates that suggest that would unlock something like 45 to 50 billion rand in direct investment in the rail network, in locomotives, wagons, and so on. Um, but that leaves aside the huge impact on the economy as a whole if the freight rail system actually works, um, both for imports and for exports. We're also going to be seeing private sector participation in container port terminals as Transnet has announced um, with RFPs following the RFIs that were issued in August last year by Transnet. And that will enable new investment um, in, in the two major container terminals, the upgrading and expansion of that infrastructure. And also crowding in private sector skills for management and operations and turning those really poorly performing terminals into world-class operations. 
We're also close to finalizing the work visa review, which the President spoke about in SONA. Uh, that goes beyond just the critical skills list, but will make recommendations about the work visa system as a whole and about changes that could be made to attract skills and investment um, to South Africa, to bring skilled um, people um, where, where there are skills shortages um, to the country. And then finally in the water sector, um, we're, we've seen the finalization of the National Water Resources Infrastructure Agency Bill. Um, that will be published soon for public comment. And that agency, which will effectively be a, a kind of sunrail for water, will be a major institutional reform in the water sector. It'll enable better management of bulk water resources, investment in those resources, but also new models for private sector participation and investment at that level. We should also point out that although this speaks to the existing list of reforms, those 26 actions, we're also working on additional reforms. Um, so we've begun work, um, and I think Garth Strachan is here somewhere, but we've begun work on creating an enabling environment for hemp and cannabis to really encourage a commercial, industrial hemp and cannabis industry in South Africa. Um, we are beginning work on the procurement regime and particularly to establish a fit-for-purpose procurement system for SOEs that would enable them to operate commercially um, while still you know, including sufficient safeguards. Um, and then on the electricity front, which we recognize as the single most important constraint on growth, um, looking at further actions that could be taken to end load shedding um, beyond what's already the efforts that are already underway. And the president, um, in his budget vote speech two weeks ago, spoke about that work uh, and the need for a coordinated, coherent plan that brings all the pieces together um, and, and outlines the actions that, that, that can be taken to actually bring load shedding to an end. So th those are areas to really look out for in the coming weeks and months. And then finally, just to give a sense of how OV works uh, on all of these reforms. Rudy spoke about the 100 megawatt threshold. Um, and in June last year, the announcement was made that Schedule 2 of the, the Act, Electricity Regulation Act, would be amended to raise the licensing threshold. Um, and, and that really opened the space for massive investment in new um, electricity generation. Um, but following that, we've been doing a lot of work to accelerate those investments um, and realize the impact. So we've established a joint task team that meets weekly with all the government departments, ESCOM, and the private sector. Um, we've been working to remove obstacles to investment. We've seen changes in the NURSA registration process already, the removing um, of the requirement for a power purchase agreement as part of the registration process is one example from the last few weeks. We've shortened the time frames for EIAs and water use licenses by designating all of these projects as strategic infrastructure projects. Um, and ESCOM itself has built dedicated capacity to expedite grid connection approvals. So in all of these ways, across the, the many different approvals that are needed to build um, a generation facility, we've been working to unblock those. And what we've seen in that pipeline, um, we're, we're tracking at the moment 68 projects their combined capacity is over 5,000 megawatts, and those are real projects that are at various stages of development, development, not just uh, concepts. To illustrate how fast that sector is moving, um, two weeks ago that number was 58, and the megawatts was 4,500. So on a weekly basis, more projects are, uh, are, are getting approval, um, moving ahead, um, and, and that pipeline is growing. So that brings us to the end. I hope we've broadly stuck to time. And, and perhaps just to, to round it off, I think there is a lot of cynicism out there 
um, about the reform agenda. And that's understandable given where we've come from as a country and also given how far we still have to go uh, on this road. But what we've tried to show is that progress really is being made. There, there are concrete, um, demonstrable steps being taken to implement these reforms. There are specific commitments with time frames um, and priorities. And, and a lot of work is happening in the background to get these reforms over the line. So although we're very focused on the immediate challenges, the load shedding, the challenges in freight rail and the ports and so on, um, what these reforms allow us to do is to imagine what South Africa could look like in, in the years to come as the reforms are, are implemented and as they take effect and to imagine a country in which we have um, ended load shedding, in which we have a competitive, dynamic electricity market, in which we have a world-class freight logistics system that draws on the best of, of our private sector capabilities, um, where we have stable and a reliable supply of water, um, and where we, we've really um, resolved many of these challenges in those key network industries that will allow sectors like, like yours in manufacturing to thrive, to invest, and to create jobs. So this work is happening, uh, and what it needs now, I think, is for government, for business, and in fact for all South Africans to, to rally behind the reform agenda and to give it wind in its sails, um, to make sure that it, that it happens and that it takes takes its full effect.